Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's presentation on Are You Ready for a 30% Market Sell-Off? My name is Tom, and I will be this evening's moderator. And I want to start tonight's presentation by extending a very special thank you to GoldEagle.com, who is sponsoring tonight's webinar. Since 1997, GoldEagle.com has been a leading research destination for investing insights and commentary on gold, precious metals, and even the economy in general. So again, a very special thank you to GoldEagle.com. Now, we also understand this topic is going to bring in a lot of questions, and we welcome them. We're going to try to get to as many as we possibly can. So please feel welcome to post your questions at any time, and we will be answering as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Now, we have multiple analysts tonight from ElliottWaveTrader.net prepared to share their expertise with you. And frankly, we have a lot to cover. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome our first speaker and founder of ElliottWaveTrader.net, Avi Gilbert. Thank you very much for being here, Avi. Thanks, Tom. I'll take the controls. I don't see them yet. They're on their way. Okay, can you guys see me? You're looking good. Great. Okay, first, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for joining us this evening. And uh, rather than waste any more time, let's move right into the webinar. Um, for those of you that have followed our analysis through the years, you knew this time was coming. As you've seen from the monthly chart that, uh, that I've continually published, uh, this really has kept us on the correct side of the market for many years. And it's kept us strongly bullish while most of the market seem to always be looking for that major market top. Now, I'm, I'm going to move to the daily chart for a few minutes uh, right now. Hold on. And there we go. Um, I just want to show you how we got here over the last few years. So it gives you a better understanding of where we are and where we're going. So back in 2015, as we were coming towards the end of the year, uh, you know, we were looking for the market to top out you know, in this region around 2100 or so and give us a pullback towards about 1750 to about the 1800 region. But uh, you know, our primary wave count was really that that was only going to be a fourth wave within a much larger third wave off the 2009 lows. And that means we really had a minimum expectation of the market to rally to the 2600 region from the 1800 region. So when the market dropped down towards that 1800 region, you know, we were warning all our subscribers, don't get too bearish, don't get so bearish. And the market was setting up for a major rally as we were looking towards 2016 and 2017. And for those of you that remember that period of time, most market participants and analysts were very bearish and were expecting a major market top to be formed. What else is new? But we were pounding the table the time, that time, suggesting that we are about to see, a, as we put it, a global melt up in all types of assets across the world as we were going into 2016. And when the market rallied off our expected support region and then pulled back into the US elections in November of 2016, most were looking for another market crash if Trump won the election. Again, we were pounding the table for a rally to 2600 plus, no matter who won the election. As the market continued to rally as we expected and provided us with even further extensions within this wave three of five of three, we modified our longer term targets and started to look for that 3,011 to 3,225 region for the top of, of this wave three off the 2009 lows. And the closer we got to our target for this wave three off the 2009 lows, the more cautious we became. And for those who can count beyond three, well, it means wave four should, not, should now follow the completion of wave three. As you can see from the daily chart, wave four is still considerably below where we currently trade. In fact, a fourth wave pullback will often target the fourth wave of one lesser degree. Technically, that's that 1800 region that we pulled back into in, in early 2016. But when the fifth wave of the third wave um, sees an extension, the market will only target really down to the second wave of that fifth wave extension. So that really puts us for an upper target for this fourth wave um, correction 
into the 2000 to 2200 region. And when we overlap the 0.382 retrace of wave three, that comes up to the top of our target region, as you can see, around that 2200 region. So there's a nice, a lot of nice confluence around that 2200 region, 2100, 2200 region. That that is what we're really looking for uh, for uh, this larger degree third wave. Um, so we have a lot of air below us before we reach the ideal target for a fourth wave of this magnitude. Now I also alluded to the potential that you know we may not even yet be completed with this fifth wave just yet. Um, for those that follow us over the long term, you know we've been targeting the 3011 3225 region for the top of this, for this third wave for several years. But we only topped at 2940 on the SPX, and it's about 70 points shy of you know, the lower end of our target region. So when we don't reach our targets, it, it does leave some amount of question in our mind. Now, there's still several ways the market may try to strike that target. I'll discuss two of them now. There's another third one I think maybe Garrett and Zach may be touching upon when they show you their stock charts. But I'm going to just discuss two of them for how we can get back up to that 3011 region. But remember this, even if it does stretch higher, it still suggests that the downside is likely much greater than the, the upside potential that we have left in the market. Now, I can't guarantee this to be a fact, but I can tell you with a lot of confidence that the risks have risen quite high, that we are getting close to that 30% correction we expect once wave three completes. So let's look at the, the 60 minute chart I track. There we go. And I'll show you how the market may still stretch to the 3011 to 3050 region to complete an ending diagonal for this wave three off the 2009 lows. As you can see on the chart, the way and the wave count outlined in blue, even in this scenario, the market is going to remain quite choppy on its way higher to completion, assuming it even plays out in this fashion. But the more important point is that once it does complete, if it does complete that rally, it's likely going to reverse quite strongly back down to the point from which this diagonal began. And that again is the 2500 to 2600 region. And that's typical action we see once an ending diagonal completes. So I'm going to move back to the daily chart for the second way we can still get to those targets. Uh, so as you can see, if we already have topped already, um, or if we have one more higher to go before we top, it means the market is likely going to come down to the next lower target box for the A wave of four. In other words, one way or another, I think we have a date with that region marked as the A wave of four. It's possible we may even strike it as early as tomorrow or, or, or Friday. Now, we could strike that target box as early as this week. So, you know, I think we are going to strike that general region for an A wave of wave four. So that now brings me to the second way the market may attempt to get to that 3011 region. So as you can see on the daily chart, I have a yellow alternative B wave target right at the bottom of our long-term target box. Now when a primary trend fails to reach its ideal target region, we sometimes see the B wave of the ensuing fourth wave come back to strike that target. And it provides us with what's called an expanded B wave rally, expanded B wave. And when the market turns too bearish too quickly, which seems to be happening right now, this can happen more often than not in order to reset market sentiment to prepare for a crash like C wave drop, which is what we're, we're still expecting. C waves normally feel like crashes. So it's for this reason that I, I've been suggesting to our members in some of my write-ups that a drop towards that 2600 region could be a very good buying opportunity. Because we would expect a, you know, some type of multi-month rally that's going to take us back at least to the 2800 region, as you can see the bottom of even the smaller B wave. With the potential, we may rally up as high as that 3011 region in expanded B wave. So there's a really good buying opportunity if we can get down into that target box for the A wave, especially if it hits this week. So either by filling in the rest of the diagonal or seeing a B wave rally, it means that you know we're likely going to see a rally into the end of the year, which everyone seems to expect as the regular Santa rally. 
and how it develops will, will likely tell us how high this can take us. But over the next few weeks, the market's going to give us a lot more clarity as to whether Wave 3 has indeed, indeed completed or not. And whether it has or not, based upon our expectations, I think it's going to take a number of months before the market sets up to drop down to that 2000 to that 2200 region. It's not going to happen overnight. And But when it does happen and we get that set up, it will ultimately feel like a market crash to many, especially since we really haven't experienced any major downside in this market for many years. So ultimately, I think you still have some amount of time before the market sets up to drop down to that 2000 to 2200 region. And you have plenty of time to plan your exiting of your long positions and preparing for a significant drop in the, in the coming months. But after our being staunchly bullish for many years, while others were bearish during this last 64% rally in the market, we're suggesting that the upside is becoming much more dangerous. And we are likely setting up for a major 30% correction in wave four in the coming year or two. So the purpose of this webinar is to outline our understanding of where we reside in the long-term trend and to give you some ideas about how you can prepare for the 30% correction we're expecting as we look towards 2019 and 2020. So with me today, I have Leo Valencia, I have Mike Golombeski, I have Zach Manis, and I have Garrett Patton. Uh, they will be going through various uh, perspectives about, for example, Leo is going to give you some option strategies about how to protect yourself um, during the downturn. Mike is going to show you how we trade the VIX for, uh, for profitability during these downturns. And Zach and Garrett are going to go through a whole host of stock charts to show you which ones still have potential, which ones are, may, may turn out to be good shorting opportunities. So you'll be able to see the underlying stocks of the market so you get a better understanding of how the overall market is set up as we speak. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to them. Thank you very much, Avi. And we're going to get things started as as Avi said here. Actually, Avi, if we could do one thing just before we pass. Uh, we yeah. did have a couple questions just for some people that are really brand new to Elliott Wave. The um, the target region, if you could just use your mouse and kind of highlight that target A region that we're going to see. So in the this A region right here. That's where we're thinking in the in the kind of a more immediate term that you believe we're going to tag. Right. And then we're either going to move up to the green B in the um, in the blue box or that expanded a scenario that Avi is talking about would be that yellow um, alt B, um, just a little bit higher towards, if you look to the right, that 3011 number. So just for some of you that that wasn't coming through clearly, I just wanted to make sure to uh, uh, to pass or uh, to pass that along. What it basically means is that we're expecting a lot of machinations in this region um, over the coming months, but those machinations are probably going to be setting up a uh, a top, a market top. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Avi. And uh, now um, all of you should be looking at Leo's opening slide, which is um, <laughs> you're going to learn a little bit about Leo right here with his with his terminology. But uh, Leo, thank you so much for being here. And I just wanted to pass things over to you to get you started. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, welcome, folks. I mean, the title is Hedging with Options in Case Western Civilization Ends. I mean, that's an inside joke that we have in the room. but. You never know if it will happen. So in order to prepare for this uh, correction, I, I think it's very useful to look at the past to see what has happened before during a correction that takes such a long time to happen. You know, this this 30% correction down won't happen in a day or in one week. No, it's going to last and it's going to last uh, a long time. It's a multi-month correction, probably one year correction. So. The closest one we have is the, the 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 one we got back in 2007 to 2009, and I and I think everyone is very familiar with the um, with how the market dropped and you know hit the 666 magic number and then came back or rallying or, or or you know from from the lows. But I think it's useful to also look at a different way at the market. So the the chart on the right shows you how the market behaved in terms of weekly log returns. Why are you see what is a weekly log return? It's just how much the market move in percentage terms in one week. No? Uh, and I think I find that useful because we, we can understand, it's easy to understand than implied volatility or realized volatility. This is a measure that people can relate to. So if you notice during 2007 and early 2008, I mean, the market moved between 5% 
up and down, up and down. It was kind of limited. Uh, and that was kind of the normal volatility back at that time. No, this was very normal. No, nowadays, this looks like a lot of volatility, but back in the day, this was kind of the normal thing. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, so then you notice how well, the moves in the market started to increase dramatically. And during the, like the, main period of the fall like here during this period of time look at what happened to the weekly returns the market has started to move dramatically like 20 percent down 15 uh, percent up and gigantic moves up and down up and down this is very typical uh during a market correction so this is what we should expect when 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 the correction that Avi is talking about happens. We should expect dramatic moves in a weekly basis, and we need to be prepared for that. And I, and I mentioned this because options are very susceptible to this kind of thing. Options really work on the movement of the market. And also, notice how long it took for the moves to normalize. Like almost all the way to 2010, um, it took the market to come back to whatever we used was the old regime. So let's prepare on that regard. We need to be prepared in terms of moves. And, and I'm preparing this kind of density charts. Don't get confused. It just shows you how frequent you get the move. So you notice that during the periods of calm, the, the market move between minus 2 and 2% very frequently. Like the, the most of the moves happen right here in the body of this chart. But once the correction has started, notice how the, the, the density was bound between minus 10 and 10, and we have like extremely outlier movements at 20. So it's kind of a different way of visualizing the gigantic moves that we are going to see. So we have to be prepared for that. And finally, here is a look at what happened to implied volatility measured by the VIX index. So during 2007 and early 2008, VIX was around 20, which 20 is, we are around 20 right now, and it feels like the world is ending. But back at the, <laughs> during this year, 20 was the normal number. 20 was the average, the historical average of VIX. But notice how once the correction started, notice the VIX uh, touch 80. I mean, it was crazy. And not only that, notice that VIX remained elevated, which in, in other words, implied volatility remain, remained elevated for quite a long time. It took pretty much all the way to 2010 for implied volatility to return to normal levels. So once the correction starts, we're going to expect uh, implied volatility to move really high and remain elevated for a long period of time. So implied volatility will remain elevated, which means options will remain expensive for a long period of time. And also, realized volatility, as you saw on the weekly log returns, will tick substantially higher. So we will, we're going to expect a lot of drops and a lot of bounces very violent. So what are the lessons from here if we are option traders? If you have a portfolio right now, and uh, like, like you, you really have your long only portfolio, you want to buy protection before it gets expensive. You know that once implied volatility gets expensive, that's it. It's gonna be exp it's gonna be expensive for uh, like nine to twelve months. So you, you if your protection has to be purchased before it happens, probably uh, around that B wave that uh, Avi is talking about. That's kind of a, a moment where it's gonna be cheap and it's going to be nice. And also, if you're doing any fancy strategy, you have to accommodate the big bounces that are expected. I know some people love to sell calls, upside calls, but you know, you have to be mindful that the market will have big bounces. So I'm going to offer you a, a couple of strategies in particular that, well, I mean, depending on the type of portfolio you have. So for if your portfolio has a small number of stocks or if out of all the universe of stocks you have in your portfolio, because you are overweight or because you have certain preference, you only want to protect a certain number of them. I think protective colors will be the perfect trade for this correction. Why a protective collar? Because a protective collar has one leg of the collar is your right calls, which means you sell calls. Uh, and they are protected with your chairs. So you're not actually doing anything fancy here. You're just selling calls uh, and, and writing them against the chairs that you have. And you are harvesting you know, volatility around 90 or more days. Now you can do it every three months, every, I don't know, it's, it's up to you. And with enough room to the upside, probably the targets that Avi was talking about. And then at the same time, 
you buy catastrophic put protection. So what is catastrophic? You know, catastrophic is 20% or more or 15% or more, depending on the stock you're holding. It's, it strikes that are really far of the money. And you execute that thing as a single trade. That's, that's what is called a protective color. The beauty of the trade is it doesn't require any margin at all. And also, it could be entered at a credit. I mean, if the calls, if you, if you buy, you write the calls and the puts are cheap, you, you can enter a credit or a very small premium. So you're buying protection either with a very small premium or with a credit, depending on how close the calls are to, <laughs> to the current target. Um, so what are the disadvantage? What is the disadvantage of this trade? Now I'm going to start with the disadvantage right away. So you, one of the disadvantages is that you are sacrificing upside potential. And, and in theory, your calls could get call away. You know, if, if there is a strong move uh, to the upside, your, your, your shares will be call away. But, you know, look, hopefully if that happens, it will be on a nice upside target. So you're actually making money in your portfolio anyway, because you're selling shares at a nice gain. Um, and that's kind of the, the main disadvantage. Uh, but then the advantage is that once the market starts to correct, once we start that the massive drop down, the puts will increase tremendously in value. I mean, I'm talking about massive increase in value and it's mostly due to imp the implied volatility explosion. That's, that's pretty much it. It's not even the, the move down. It's just that implied volatility, as you saw in the previous, uh, in, this, in this slide here, implied volatility will go through the roof. And even if the market doesn't move that much, the, your puts are going to be substantially expensive. So it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, for you, and and also it's a simple, it's very simple to enter. The only you you sell one call and you buy one put. So the ratio is one to one, and this is if you want, um, you know, you're protecting a single stock. Now, this is kind of an advanced subject, but it it could be a good moment to do it. It could be really a good moment to do a dispersion trade, and uh, and and this is a very fancy term and it's actually done by big banks and funds, but it could be uh, on your reach in particular if a correction happens. So what is a dispersion trade? If you really have a diversified portfolio, I mean, you have a portfolio that has lots of stocks uh, or not even lots of stocks. You have a portfolio that uh, has is diversified in sectors. No, you have a diversification in sectors. You could take advantage of uh, market structure. So the dispersion trade is you write the cover calls, the same thing that, that you did for the normal um, a protective caller. So you write the cover calls, being mindful of the violent bounces, of course, but instead of, instead of buying the puts for the stock, you buy index puts. And here is the key. You're buying SPX puts, you know, so XPX index uh, with, uh, out of the money strike. So you're writing the cover calls against your stock, but the puts are against index. And you're doing probably 90 days or more before the correction. And during the correction, this is uh, one kind of trade that can be done systematically as the correction progresses uh, because, you know, all of the features of implied volatility. So for if you're doing it before the correction, you pick 90 days and you're doing during the correction, then you pick near term. And the reason is, why are we doing this? Why are we doing a dispersion? Why are we writing calls in the stock and buying inputs in index? Well, we are doing it because uh, individual stocks are very expensive. Options for individual stocks are always more expensive than options for index. That's a um, law of the universe. No, it has to do like if, if you guys actually study these like portfolio theory, you will notice that a diversified portfolio has a total lower risk than the individual, that's the sum of the individual risk of every component. You know? Therefore, options for the uh, portfolio itself, for the index are cheaper in terms of implied volatility than the options for the stock. So in this case, we are selling expensive implied volatility uh, from the stock and buying relatively cheaper, <laughs> relatively cheaper, they are not going to be cheap, but compared with the with the stock puts, there's these puts from index are going to be low implied volatility. And also it works beautifully because all of this portfolio theory of diversified risk goes through the window during a market crash. 
And this is <laughs> this is where it works so beautifully. Covariance during a market crash basically becomes 1.0. So the diversified portfolio doesn't work anymore. And therefore, the puts on the index are going to increase in value tremendously. I mean, it's going to be a massive gain of those puts. Uh, and, and, and during the crash, during a correction, everything falls together. Every single thing, uh, like it, it is part of human psychology, psychology, you know? Humans will just dump whatever they are doing. And, and then that's why covariance becomes one. And then this beautiful dispersion trade will work. So that's kind of uh, the advanced trade, and but it has some considerations. So one of the considerations is that because we are selling calls from individual stocks and buying puts on the index, you would, you need to compute the correct ratio. No, it's not one to one, and, and and the correct ratio is based on the weight of the stock in your portfolio and the beta. You know, it's a it's a it's a formula. I, I'm not going to put it here, but I mean you have to consider that if you're going to pursue this strategy. Uh, for instance, if if your portfolio is actually a 100% replica of the S&P 500, like you're actually replicating the S&P 500 by hand, then in that case you sell one call for each of the 500 stocks and just buy one put for SPX. That's how it works, and that's how you collect lots of money, my friends. Uh, of course, for different portfolios, the mix changes. Then, okay, so that's that's kind of protective colors and dispersion slash color trade. But then what happens if you don't actually have a portfolio or you just want to speculate, no? Like you, you are a speculator, I am a speculator, I love speculating. Um, then we can speculate with volatility and the reaction. And given that the, the correction lasts so long, given that uh, implied volatility is persistently high, and given that downside direction is dominating, then we can use calendar trades. Calendar trades are the preferred vehicle to speculate these things. And what is a calendar trade? And a calendar trade is very simple. You just sell an XPX index put 30 days. I mean, you, you don't get closer than this. And, 30 or more, and then you buy the same put, exactly the same one that you sold, uh, two to four weeks later. Of course, the longer the, you know, if it's five weeks or uh, two months later, even better because you have higher bag exposure, which that means that as implied volatility goes up, your position goes moves really high, like you profit from implied volatility explosion. So the idea is that you profit from two sources. You profit from a move towards the strike you are selling, and also you profit from an increase in implied volatility during the, during the move, because the long leg will increase uh, faster in value than the short leg, given that it's more sensitive to Vega. And the good thing with, the beauty with calendars, downside calendars, is that you keep doing them, you know, Every week, every week. I mean, as the market comes down, as your strike is hit, then you do another one and you keep repeating those things. Now, what is the considerations for these things? You know, and so the calendar trade is very good at the beginning, um, but it's very sensitive to bounces. So you have to be collecting profits consistently. You have to, if you're doing this kind of trade, because it's an speculation, you have to be prepared to collect, to collect profits and restrike during bounces. Now that's, that's kind of the systematic strategy. Also, both the dispersion and the calendar trade uh, requires European style options. Now, I mean, don't even dare to these strategies with American style options. Always use um, SPX index puts. So, so options that cannot be cannot be assigned to you if you are short. Uh, and finally, one consideration that people don't take into account is that it's better to have a regulation T account for this kind of speculative trades, uh, because if you're using portfolio margin, it is terrible. I mean, portfolio margin during a correction is the worst type of account to have. So I will recommend not doing option trades during a correction. And one of the reasons is that, remember that for portfolio margin accounts, the margin computations are, are based on something, something called span. And during a correction, the span computations will completely destroy you, folks. So better to have like T accounts, regulation T, because margin is always known from the beginning. So that's kind of the consideration that you have. And and that's it. That Those are kind of the, the traits I, I propose uh, for the correction. 
That's fantastic. And and if everyone has uh, if anyone has questions about some of these trades or setups, we may not be able to get to them tonight, but we'll try to. So please go ahead and put those in. And when we do Q and A at the end, uh, we will try to uh, pluck out some that we think could be uh, great examples. So, uh, Leo, thank you very much for. Uh, being here and for sharing your expertise with us and hopefully we'll be able to circle back with you for some questions uh, next up as as Avi mentioned at the beginning of the presentation is, is Mike Kolombeski and Mike will be sharing uh, his knowledge on the VIX uh, with us so uh, can everyone maybe just give me a quick round does everybody see Mike's opening slide how to trade the VIX and prosper during market downturns we do so you're good to go Mike thanks all right, thanks uh, Tom and thanks Leo for the intro. So we're gonna talk about uh, the, the VXX and a little bit about the VIX and basically how to uh, trade the VXX and prosper during market downturns. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the overview of the VIX service here at ElliottWaveTrader.net, which is the service that I run. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the VIX, the volatility exchange traded products, namely the VXX. Uh, how we use Elliott Wave to successfully track the volatility uh, exchange traded products, again, namely the VXX. Uh, we'll show some recent examples of uh, trades that we've used uh, Elliott Wave analysis on the VXX. And we'll take a look at what the current wave counts are on the VXX and what I'm looking for moving forward. Okay, so the VIX service uh, is a service here at Elliott Wave Trader, and uh, in the service, I provide daily and intraday analysis of the VIX, the VXX, VIX Future, and the VIX Futures markets. Uh, we provide real-time uh, trade alerts with entries, exit, and stops. Uh, those trade alerts are issued uh, using both straight shares on the VXX, as well as op VXX options, puts, and calls. And typically, we use just straight puts and calls, very simple, straightforward trades on the options. Uh, we also have some bonus trade setups uh, that are posted in the room from time to time, uh, and those can be posted on some uh, additional products. Uh, most recently, we've we've done some uh, some trading on the DIA, which is the Dow Jones Industrial Average ETF, and occasionally on some of the other volatility ETFs uh, other than the VXX. Uh, we also provide a weekly live video uh, in the VIX service, uh, which we review the current analysis on the v on the VIX, the VXX also go over my take on uh, the current uh, stance on the equity markets. And we'll also go over any open trades and uh, then it'll open things up to questions and answers to all VIX service members who are in attendance. These videos are recorded for later viewing for anybody who have missed the video live. Okay, so what's the VIX? So the VIX or the, the spot VIX as it's known is uh, an index that's calculated by the Chicago Board of Exchange. Uh, and the VIX index is what the market expects realized volatility to be 30 days out to the future. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the VIX is referred to as a fear index or the market fear gauge. And we've been hearing a lot about that uh, recently with the volatility we've seen in the markets. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen some news articles talking about what the fear index uh, has been doing lately. Um, the VIX index is not directly tradable and retail traders typically use various derivatives to trade the, VX, the, the VIX. These derivatives include the VIX, VIX options, VIX futures contracts, and the volatility exchange traded products, such as the VXX, which again is what we're mainly gonna be focusing on here in this presentation. So I just wanted to go over a quick uh, historical view of, of the VIX, um, the, the spot VIX, and kind of uh, highlighting some of the uh, points that we've seen some, some large market corrections here in the past few years. Um, so in 2007 to 2009, we had the financial crisis. And again, and as Leo pointed out in his presentation, we saw the VIX rise for an extended period of time, uh, hitting a high of uh, in the low 80s during the financial crisis. And it was an extended move. Uh, it, it moved back down lower uh, into 2010. And then we saw the flash crash of, in 2010, which again saw another elevation of, of the VIX index. Again, moved back lower again, and then a black Monday of August 2011, we saw another elevation in the in the VIX index. Again, from there, it moved down fairly consistently down towards uh, 2015. We did see some oscillation up and down during that time, but we didn't see any sharp moves higher uh, that exceeded that 2011 high until the market sell-off of 2015-2016. The pundits didn't really have a name for this. Uh, uh, or reason for this 2015-16 sell, so they just called it the market sell-off. 
Uh, and then from there, we saw the a fairly uh, sustained downtrend with a couple of spikes here and there. We had Brexit in 2016. We had the October elections in 2016. Uh, ultimately leading to a, a all-time low on the VIX in November of 2017, uh, <clears throat> when the VIX hit this this level down here uh, into the uh, low eights uh, on the VIX index. Uh, February of 2018, we saw a large spike up in the VIX, uh, which was dubbed the inflation fears uh, correction. Um, and this this was this was such a large move up after seeing such low volatility it actually blew up some of the inverse volatility exchange traded products such as the XIV. Um, but that move again was very sharp and very quick in the in the VIX index. Uh, from there we saw we saw another move down uh, back to where the S&P 500 hit new all-time highs here in August of 2018. Uh, the VIX index did not break new all-time lows, so it still traded uh, quite a ways over that all-time low. And that brings us to where we're at today, where we're in the the uh, the current uh, rise in the VIX index, which has uh, been dubbed the inflation interest rate fears in October of 2018. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're at right now uh, in the VIX index. So again, so we can see during large markets uh, events, the VIX index will uh, spike higher. Uh, so kind of overlaying that onto the Dow Jones industrial chart on a longer term basis, we can see uh, these same readings uh, overlaid on the Dow chart. So uh, again, during the 2008 financial crisis, we saw the, pe the peak of the VIX index hit here in 2008. Uh, the 2009 low actually uh, had divergence on the VIX index. The VIX index did not make a new high here when the Dow broke its, its final low in 2009. Its peak was back here in 2008. Uh, the flash crash in 2007, we saw during, a, again, a, a sharp correction in the market, we saw the, the VIX index rise again. Uh, 2011, we saw the VIX index rise again, and its peak was was here. Again, the, the Dow made another low prior uh, post the high in the, in the VIX index. And from there, we had a fairly stable run up higher uh, into 2016 sorry, 2015, uh, at that at which point the VIX again saw another spike, and that was during the 2015-16 sell-off where we saw a fourth wave correction, ABC, which Avi had noted on his chart. Uh, we saw a, another wave up and some corrective action here, uh, and that was the Brexit uh, correction, the so-called Brexit correction, and again, the VIX saw a little bit of a spike there. We had some election, 2016 election drama again, a, a relatively shallow uh, retrace in the in the Dow, but the VIX did see a spike up during this time, and from that time we had a very stable market uh, all the way up into uh, t November of 2017 when we saw the new all-time low on the VIX index. Uh, from there, this last little run up higher, the the VIX wasn't making new lows; it was actually seeing a bit of a divergence with the equity markets. Uh, but it was still trading very low up until the uh, 26,616 high in the Dow. Uh, and that was just before this February drop, at which point the VIX index spiked sharply higher uh, for the February move. We saw some more volatility here uh, into the March lows on the Dow. Uh, and from there, we've seen a relatively stable VIX where it's been moving down. And then most recently, we saw another sharp move down here uh, in October. Uh, where once again the VIX index has started to perk up a bit, uh, which kind of leaves us where we're at right now with the market on the Dow. So what is an exchange-traded product? So exchange-traded products are instruments that trade like stocks and can be traded through standard equity brokerage accounts. Uh, there are many volatility exchange-traded products available to trade. Some of these uh, products include the VXX, the UVXY, the TVIX, the SVXY, and the ZIV. Uh, we primarily focus on the VXX as this product tends to be the most liquid and widely used product. It also has options available, which are also very liquid and are easily traded from a standard equities account. Okay, so the VXX, uh, the product is, uh, as we can see, this long-term chart uh, is, is uh, susceptible to uh, decay due to futures roll over the long-term time period. Um, there's a lot of mechanics that go involved in this. I don't want to get into this presentation, but I wanted to show this chart because I wanted you to really have an understanding that this isn't a, a buy and hold type of instrument. It's an instrument that will decay over the longer period of time. We can see it had an equivalent of uh, 30,720 at its peak in 2009. 
and uh, all the way down to 1270 in 2017. And I believe there was actually a split even after this point. So uh, this chart from 2017. The point is that it has uh, over the long period of time, the VXX will decay. Um, and so it's not an instrument that you want to buy and hold. Now, however, during high episodes of fear, the VXX can make sharp moves higher. So zooming into a period in, in during over the summer, we saw a very sharp move up higher on the VXX. We saw a move uh, that bottomed at 1539 and it topped at 3150. So this was a move of just about 100% higher on the VXX in a period of just a few weeks. So that bottom uh, was struck here on August 11th and the top was uh, struck here on uh, September, September 3rd. So again, just within a few weeks, we saw the VIX double in value during a high episode of fear. And this was uh, again during the summertime uh, from uh, August uh, 11th all the way to uh, September 3rd. So again, so although longer term the VIX, the VXX will decay, there are times uh, uh, during high episodes of fear that we can uh, see large moves. And the goal is to take advantage of those large moves higher uh, during the uh, during these episodes of fear, and we can use Elliott Wave analysis to help um, uh, give us guidance as when those events will occur. So we primarily apply our Elliott Wave counts on volatile exchange tra traded products, specifically the VXX. Uh, the VXX is difficult to count using Elliott Wave analysis on a longer term basis due to the decay that's inherent to this product. And we saw that on that longer term chart, which I had posted earlier. It's very difficult to put an LOA count on that longer term chart. Uh, the VXX can be counted on shorter term on a shorter term basis and does exhibit very good adherence to Elliott Wave and Fibonacci pinball rules on these shorter time frames. For this reason, we focus our Elliott Wave counts on the shorter time frame charts, typically the 240 minute charts and under, and most often the 60 minute charts and below. So this is an example of a 60-minute chart on the uh, VXX. So as we can see, this is a five-wave move to the downside, and we can count the VIX both to the downside and to the upside, and this is an example to the downside. And we can see we have a very clear five-wave move on the VXX. We have a one, two, three, four, and five. And What's more important and more interesting on this is not only that we had a five-wave move, but how well this followed our Fibonacci pinball guidelines. So again, we had a one, two, and then we had a one, two, and then a three of three, which hit our 161.8 extension, almost on the penny. We had a corrective retrace for wave four, which hit our 100 extension right on the penny, held our resistance level. We had a wave three down, which, which moved just under the 176.4 retrace. We had a wave four which moved just over the 123.6 extension. And then we had a nice five wave move to the downside, which hit the 238.2 extension almost to the penny, followed by a corrective retrace, which held the previous highs and then moved lower again. So we had a very clean five wave move to the downside, which followed our Fibonacci pinball guidelines very well, which allowed us to get in and out of, of multiple trades during this time period following this impulsive pattern to the downside. So again, the VXX uh, faults a very clean uh, patterns using our Elliott Wave analysis uh, and our Fibonacci pinball guidelines. So we can also see a chart to the upside. And this is a more recent chart. And, and this is actually the charts off the October lows. And this is also showing uh, what I'm counting as a five wave move up off the October lows. So I've got a one, two, three, four, and five. So we have one, two, and then our wave three hit just under the 161.8 extension. Our wave four held just under the 100 extension and over the 76.4 extension. And we had another five, uh, five wave move to the upside, which uh, hit the 200 extension and, and surpassed it just a bit. So again, a fairly clean one, two, three, four, five move to the upside. So we count that as wave uh, one slash A, and then we had a corrective retrace so far lower and we count that as wave either two, all of wave two, or potentially a wave A of a larger wave two. So what we're looking for in this particular move is we're looking for this to hold our support zone. Now that we have a five wave move, we're looking to hold our support zone here in this uh, indicated by this gray support box. And that support zone comes in at the 38.2 retrace all the way down to the 76.4 retrace. So as long as we're over the support zone, 
this is set up to push higher uh, over the next few weeks. Um, again, the big question right now is have we already bottomed in all of wave two per this white path or do we need another low uh, per this red path? But in either case, as long as we're holding this support zone here, the 38.2 retrace to the 76.4 retrace, the 33.69 to 28.80 levels, we're looking for a higher move. And this is, again is based on a potential five wave move to the upside. Uh, and that's what we're looking for. So we have both patterns uh, moving up and down on the v VXX using our LA wave analysis. And this allows us to uh, enter trade setups. It gives us entries, it gives us exits, and it gives us targets, and it gives us potential stop levels. And so that's how we are able to place trades using the VXX and LA wave analysis. So let's look into an example of an actual trade that we placed in the trading room. And this uh, trade was uh, placed just before the last major sell-off uh, in the markets in February and the large spike up uh, in the VXX and the, and the VIX in general uh, on February 1st. And so we'd, we'd been looking for a major bottom in that range and that's shown here by this, this uh, purple wave five here. And this is an actual chart that was posted to the room and an actual uh, trade alert that was posted to the room. And that trade alert was to buy VXX at 28.85. We had a stop loss at 25.50, and that was just under this, this previous low here. So we had a nice clean move up here with a corrective retrace, which hit the, the 61.8 retrace almost on the nose and, and turned up. Uh, at that point, it was we had a, a valid trade uh, in place. So we entered the trade here, just straight shares on the VXX. We were looking for a move up to at least 36 and potentially higher. So we were risking $3.35 on the VIX. We had a potential reward of uh, $7.15 or just over two to one risk to reward. Uh, and again, our, we had a very clearly defined uh, trade set up here with stops under this 2562 level. And uh, again, targeting over the 36, 36 level. And again, that trade was placed on February 1st. That trade alert went out on February 1st of 2018. Okay, so uh, over the next few days, that trade worked out quite well. And we can see this was the entry here where this green arrow is. It was very close to the bottom. And over the next few days, the VXX moved sharply higher. And we saw one, two, and then we had a target zone. We had revised target zones up into this 4685 to 4406 zone uh, based on how the pattern had filled out. And we were able to move, trail our stops through this whole trade up. Uh, we ended up exiting this trade right in this target zone here. Uh, and we uh, ended up selling on an average uh, 4227 from 28.85 or 46% gain on that particular trade. And we gained 30. $13.42 on a $3.35 risk. Uh, so we had a close to four to one risk to reward on this particular trade. So again, this was during uh, February correction. Uh, again, we were able to grab about 46% 46, uh, 46 return on the VXX uh, on this one particular trade using straight shares. Okay, so we also can trade the VXX using options. And this trade was also taken on February 1st, and this was a shorter term setup that we had saw. And so after a corrective retrace, we saw what counted as a decent five wave move to the upside. We had a move that moved right back into the 61.8 retrace here. And at that point, uh, alert went out to buy uh, February 2nd, 29 strike calls for 38 cents per contract. And we were looking for a move up into at least 30, 39 to 30, 84. That was the initial target zone on February 1st. And we can see that on February 2nd, uh, not only did we hit that target zone, we had exceeded it. So our initial target zone was down here in the 30s. We actually exceeded that target zone quite a bit. And, and as we move through the day, we're able to revise our target zones uh, as we uh, as the pattern filled out. Uh, our ultimate target zones ended up being here uh, in this 33.29 to 30.80 zone. We took several exits throughout the throughout the day as the, as the VXX moved higher. And we exited our final trade when we were in this target zone. We exited on an average uh, at $2.19, $2.19 per contract uh, from an average entry of 38 cents per contract. So we had a 478% uh, return on that particular trade. Uh, so for each contract that we owned, uh, we gained 
uh, return on that particular contract. And then one final trade, and this was from March of 20, this was March 21st of 2018. Again, this is still during that last uh, market correction that we saw from February, uh, the Dow bottomed uh, on March 31st. So still, uh, again, the market was moving up and down. And this is another trade we took to the long side uh, on the VXX using options. And so we had, again, a one, two set up to the upside here as shown in purple. Uh, and a trade alert went out on this particular day to buy VIX uh, March 23rd, 41 strike calls at 72 cents per contract. Uh, and then we were looking for a move back over the 45 uh, high. And that ended up uh, working out. So we got a nice move up higher. And on this one, this particular trade, we exited on average $2.51 per contract uh, from an entry price of 78 cents. And this particular trade averaged out at 250% return on that particular trade. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we were able to take advantage of uh, volatile markets uh, when the market's moving down. Uh, and the VIX and the VXX are moving higher. We're able to take advantage of both straight share trades as well as option trades. Uh, and we're able to take several trades, uh, risking very little on our account and uh, getting very nice returns uh, using those, those methods um, and, and managing our risk. So during the February to March of 2018 examples, the, VX, the VXX itself moved up to 150% from the January 2018 lows into the after hour highs in February. As I showed in the previous slide, we were able to grab about 45% of that. Um, a, a large portion of this 150% move happened after hours. Uh, but again, we grabbed about 45% of that on a trade. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, to give perspective to that, moved down approximately 12% off of those highs into the March lows during the same time period. So again, 150% higher on the VXX, 12% on the Dow. So we didn't need to grab all of the VXX to, to make uh, very nice trades and, and grow our account during this time period, even using straight shares, as we had a, a very outsized move on the VXX versus what we saw on the equity markets. Again, the Dow moved down 12%, the VXX moved up 150% during that time period. The total cumulative returns in the VIX service at Elliott Wave Trader for all trades, winners and losers, we didn't win every trade. I showed you some of the winners, but we didn't lose every trade. We didn't win every trade. We did have some losers during that time period. Um, from the market top uh, in February until the market bottom in March 31st on options uh, was a total of 826%. So again, that's that's a per trade basis. So uh, basically we had uh, on those option trades, we gained 826% cumulatively on all the winners and the losers. The cumulative total returns in the VIX service at LA Wave Trader for all of the trades, again, winners and losers, uh, on straight equity trades on the VXX was 54%. So we saw the, the one trade that I had pointed out was uh, about 42%. And we had a few others in there that uh, gave us a total of about 54% on straight share trades on the VXX. Uh, so those were the numbers that we hit during this time from February 1st until March 31st. So that was the the top in the Dow until the bottom in the Dow during that time period, then that volatile, volatile time period. So again, during volatile time periods, we're able to take advantage of, uh, of large movements in the VXX, and that allows us to uh, help uh, offset some of our potential losses that we may have in equity markets or just, uh, just straight speculative trades uh, to grow our accounts using the VXX and the VIX service. Okay, so where are we in the in the account on the VXX uh, currently? Okay, so as I noted previously on the other slide, I've, I'm counting what we have as a five wave move up off of this uh, October low. So that is suggestive that we will see new highs prior to seeing new lows under 2582. So my primary perspective at this point in time is that we'll see another high back over this 3858 higher prior to breaking under 2582. So this allows us to uh, to enter the trade at a couple of spots. So we've already got a trade in place here. If we're able to move down in this red path for the C wave, it will give us another opportunity to enter a trade. Or if we just move down in this white path, it'll give us an opportunity to enter a trade here as well. So we have several options that we can enter a trade on the near term, looking for further upside movement on the VXX. 
And this again is a, a 60 minute time frame, and this is based on a five wave structure that we're watching here on this particular count. If we take a look at the bigger picture perspective, uh, we can see that over the, over the course of the next several months, uh, this has the potential to move much higher <clears throat> uh, if indeed the market has already bottomed as it certainly has the potential to have done. Again, I'm counting five waves up off of this recent low. <clears throat> so one, two, three, four, five for a wave A slash one. And then again, looking for this support zone to hold as indicated by this gray box and looking for uh, a move at least back over this last high. And at that point, we'll be looking for uh, to see if we can get to this 100 extension here, uh, currently showing at 41.43. Through that level, opens the door, seeing a very sharp move back up into the 54.19 zone. Uh, and then at that point, we'd be looking for support for wave four and potentially wave five, close to the February highs that were struck back at 65, 64.97 zone. Uh, if we can see a move back into that zone, that potentially would give us a, a top of a wave A per this red path, which should then be followed by a wave B and then another wave C higher. And again, this fits with the path that Avi was showing on his particular chart where he's got an A wave and then a B wave and a C wave. So again, if we've made a significant top uh, in the markets, we certainly could see the VXX see an extended period, uh, extended period, uh, period of, uh, of larger upside moves over the next several months and into 2019. Uh, and likely it'll, it'll take the form of large ABCs, but it should give us plenty of opportunities to uh, uh, enter trades, uh, both straight shares as well as options. Um, and again, we can see that uh, the, the move that was uh, in February was just a 10% correction. So this was about a 10 to 12% correction here and, and the VXX moved up from 25 all the way up to 65. And so we can imagine what a 30% move would look like in the equity markets. Um, again, I'm showing a fairly conservative approach here where we're moving back up towards that 65 level. Um, but again, if we see a 30% move, uh, we could easily see the VXX move significantly higher than what is even shown on this particular chart. Okay, and so that does it for me. So thanks for listening to me and I'll turn it back over to Tom. Thank you very much, Mike. We really appreciate that. Uh, next presenter tonight is going to be Garrett Patton. Uh, so as we uh, move everything over to Garrett, I did just want to let everyone know as, as Garrett's screen's loading that uh, many of you are familiar with our presenters tonight, but we also greatly understand that some of you are not. So earlier in the presentation, I put in the chat box a link to where you could see the entire team that's presenting tonight. I am going to put that in, in there again, so just watch it. It should be coming through in the next few moments. So Garrett, it looks like you're all loaded up, so whenever you're ready, you can start. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tom. Um, as traders and as investors, we deal in a market of stocks, as the saying goes. And in the Stockwave service of our site, we found a lot of value in that statement and in that approach. Basically, we look at the individual sectors that make up these indices and the individual stocks that make up these sectors and indices, and we try to gain clues based on those individual stocks of where the overall indices may be heading and which individual stocks may support which potential outcome. So a lot of value can be had in looking a little bit more in detail as the market, um, as individual stocks, as individual sectors, rather than just viewing it as that larger whole by paying attention only to the indexes like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, so what I wanted to do is basically go through uh, a broader overview of the individual sectors and highlight a couple of stocks that we think may be opportunities there. And then I'll pass it over to Zach, who's going to look at some other areas of the market as well. Um, before going into that, though, I did want to make a comment about um, an approach to trading during fourth waves. I've posted this a lot if you're a member on the site during a fourth wave correction. My focus and my recommendation is always on capital preservation. It's usually not a period during the market where you're going to be trying to grow your portfolio substantially. Instead, you wanna be focused on, again, capital preservation so that once that correction completes, you have the capital able to deploy in the market and take advantage of that next trending move overall. And as you saw from the charts that Leo showed you, there are, you know, situations during these corrections where there's a lot of volatility. The overall swings, both to the upside and the downside, are going to be much larger in magnitude than you're going to see during those trending portions. So 
Um, that usually requires a multifaceted approach uh, when investing in stocks. So uh, a lot of times you're going to have both positions on the long side and the short side to um, help. Um, obviously, if you're a little bit too overexposed to the long side, having some shorts in your portfolio is going to help mitigate any downside in the market overall and also help you take advantage of, of some of those areas that may um, end up bucking the trend overall or just you know trade independently of the market overall. Um, another good approach and I think a good complement to the Stockwave service is going to be Leo's option service. As he pointed out, you can use um, option strategies such as those protected collars and dispersion trades to help protect yourself against downside in the market or downside in specific stocks if you choose to hold them through the correction or even if you're attempting to buy things a little bit early or, or basically trade during that correction so let's go ahead and jump into some of those individual sectors and i tried to basically color code them here according to expectations right now um, the ones that are red or uh, pink, I, I guess I should say, are the ones that I think offer the best opportunity for the most downside or the strongest argument that we've put in that top as primary wave three is obviously stated at the beginning of the webinar and are beginning the primary fourth wave correction. The ones that are in yellow are ones that offer trade opportunities most likely going forward, but I think we need a little bit more information to better determine um, which scenario that Avi highlighted at the beginning of the webinar is going to be playing out. And then finally, the ones highlighted in green are the ones that I think can offer the best opportunities to the upside or that are probably going to be trading independently of the market overall and not necessarily follow the same exact path as the larger indices like the S&P 500. So to start off with looking at the medical devices, IHI is the ticker here. Um, this one, I think, is a strong candidate for that top in place as our primary third wave. We saw a very extended third wave move to the upside here, hitting beyond standard FIBS within Fibonacci pinball, came all the way to a 2382 extension, more than enough to consider our primary third complete. Subwaves look complete when you look at these smaller time frames, and easily can beginning be beginning that larger primary fourth wave correction, which can take us down know, in that same sort of 30% magnitude of a pullback. XLV is one of the areas where I see the potential for that um, further push higher. It's not out of the question that we've already put in that top. I can easily see that supported by the chart here in the LA wave count, that top in place for our third wave and starting an extended correction as this fourth. But it is an area where I see an opportunity to see, again, another extension or push higher, obviously from a little bit lower here, as you see on the chart, but maybe making one more higher high before we begin that more extended correction. And one of the, um, or two of the stocks that I wanted to take a look at within that sector that I think would offer the best opportunity if you are going to attempt to trade for their upside uh, in the healthcare sector would be um, some of the pharmaceutical companies. LLY and Pfizer PFE are the two that I think really look incomplete to the upside here. The high that we struck earlier this month, likely only being wave three of three, should see a little bit further downside in this correction as wave four of three, but then that offers a trade opportunity to continue playing with the direction of the trend and looking for a move higher in wave five of three. So the same count pretty much applies here for the PFE chart as well. Again, looking for a little bit lower in this fourth and then likely seeing another move higher as long as that support holds in the wave five of three. Uh, next up and um, somewhat similar, we have the biotech chart. Uh, the same sort of larger ABC extension higher is possible here, but I think a better case can be made for that extension scenario for further upside on the XBI chart in comparison to the IBB. So that's why IBB is colored red and XBI is colored yellow. So you may even consider a pair trade here where you're short IBB and long XBI since uh, it looks better set up in the XBI chart to attempt that further push higher. We didn't quite get that same extension to the upside we saw on IBB or the same strength during that portion um, between kind of spring and summer of this year 
on the XBI charts where the IBB filled out a much better looking fifth wave to the upside there. Now you'll see that XLF is highlighted in orange, uh, different than the rest of the ones. The reason I put that one in orange is because there's still this one more possible chance for price to push higher here. And that's what you see shown in red. But if that scenario fails, this is one of the areas of the market that we see the most danger to the downside. Um, if it is starting a primary fourth wave correction, there's more than 30% to the downside likely for this chart. And even some of the individual banks could see vastly lower or vastly deeper of a correction than just 30%. Um, one of the names that we've been highlighting in the Stockwave service on our site is Morgan Stanley. That's one of the larger banks that we see potentially with the most risk to basically be a catalyst for some sort of uh, a Lehman type event, or if there's uh, um, an individual stock that gets blamed within the sector for some sort of crash scenario or significant downside, we're kind of looking at Morgan Stanley as one of the contenders to potentially see that um, catalyst unfold. So unlike a lot of the other charts that you see um, that I've shown and that you've seen so far in the webinar being counted as impulses or five waves to the upside, a lot of the individual bank charts look corrected overall in this bull market rally off of the 2008-2009 lows. Only a corrective ABC and usually when you have a pattern like that on a stock, especially at this degree on a weekly chart, that means you're set up for a move to come back all the way to where that pattern originated from, all the way back down and potentially below the low that was struck in 2008. So definitely see some serious risk here in the financial sector. But again, the reason it is colored orange is because there may be a few individual components here that can still show some strength and push it to one more high. And we haven't completely taken that scenario off of the chart yet. KRE though, unlike the XLF, looks much more convincing that the top is in place for that wave three and beginning the fourth wave pullback here. Not necessarily the best place to be entering a short trade here, but if you, again, were interested in a similar pair trade, you may consider once the situation arises uh, along in XLF and pair that with a short in XRE. XLK is one of the ones that I labeled as red because I see the um, odds much more in favor of a top in place here for that primary third and price beginning the primary fourth wave correction. A lot of the individual stocks that make up the NASDAQ and make up the technology se sector um, itself also fit very well with um, larger stops in place and beginning fourth wave corrections. And another one, maybe not so much on XLK itself, but uh, some of the individual stocks certainly have room for more than 30% downside in their respective fourth waves. Um, there is one outlier here though that I did want to point towards. For those of you who like uh, the larger cap quality stocks, we have been highlighting Apple as one of the FANG members that does not look complete to the upside. So if you really want to still be invested in that sector, I would recommend that you do so more heavily in Apple or just Apple alone, because it seems to have the best potential to extend one more time higher and see further upside before it puts in its respective major top. Semiconductors, another one that is labeled yellow because it basically had a very extended move up off of the 2015 low. You saw a lot of outperformance in that sector, more than enough upside to consider that primary third wave complete and price beginning the primary fourth wave pullback. However, when I look at a lot of the individual charts and the patterns on those respective charts, it seems to support the possibility of another extension higher there as well. Um, so it's another situation where I don't think it's an immediate trade setup. It's one that we have to watch for. And if further evidence begins to develop that favors that extension setup to the upside, um, semiconductors may be an area that you want to look towards for some upside plays. Um, ITA, Aerospace and Defense ETF, uh, another one that 
can easily top in or count is topped in the primary third. Um, more than enough upside of the fibs that we reached here are very standard for a third wave overall. But the pattern into that high, it leaves a little bit to be desired. It, it kind of counts best as only three waves. You know, it really would look a little bit more textbook or a little bit more satisfying or perfect if we were able to get one more push higher here. It doesn't really, I think, constitute as good of a trade setup or potential as maybe um, some of those sem semiconductor stocks or maybe um, some of the healthcare ones or Apple, for example, that I highlighted otherwise. XLY, very good case can be made here for that primary third wave top in place. I do have the alternative there for the extension scenario in red, but definitely lean towards that top in place here and clearly corrective bounce in these stocks or in XLY for this blue B wave overall can set up a great short for that C wave lower. XLI, I, I highlighted this one as green. It, you could consider it yellow though, because we do need to wait to see if this setup is gonna hold. But I do think that this is the strongest argument made in the individual sectors for that. Um, I guess Avi didn't show you that specific example. I think it was the third one he referred to, but didn't actually go over of an expanded flat for wave four, where the high that we saw earlier this month was actually a B wave. Price coming down in a C wave, and we're going to reattempt that fifth wave higher. So certainly a really good setup if we can hold that. I think the strongest argument for that potential again being made on the XLI chart, but I think we need to wait to see if first support holds, and then whether we get a nice one to start to that fifth wave to the upside before attempting that trade. Uh, next up on XRT, the retail, another chart that we feel very strongly has put in a major top here. Um, actually, earlier in August this year, it was one of the charts that topped sooner and one that we highlighted as um, much more bearish looking going forward compared to a lot of the other sectors in our stock wave service. Not an immediate short setup because it does look like it is completing the initial wave one to the downside of a C wave. So we want to wait for that corrective bounce in wave two. But I think a great short setup once we get that to, to uh, then play that third wave to the downside. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip over tan. Uh, it, yellow again, it, it has some potential, but it's it's starting to trade a little bit lower than ideal, and we have nothing off low yet to really set up a long trade there. Um, XLE, an, another situation where there is some potential, it doesn't necessarily trade in the same fashion as the larger market, so certainly could decouple in that respect. But uh, another one we need to be a little bit more patient and wait for a trade setup to develop there, but uh, it may end up being another area where we have some opportunity to the long side, and same with XLP. XLB and a XHB. Um, another situation where it left a lot to be desired as far as how this topped, both seem to have potentially topped in a three-wave structure. Usually you want to see a nice five-wave structure when you're hitting a major high like this. So uh, both haven't completely invalidated that potential to get one more push higher, but um, obviously very dangerous to attempt to knife catch at the moment until we get a better setup to maybe see one more push higher there. Um, and then finally, and Zach will go in a little bit more in detail in this area, but XME overall for metals and mining, obviously much different pattern than the rest of the market here and an area where we think can offer a lot of safety um, and not necessarily to mitigate downside in the rest of your portfolio, but could even just be viewed as you know an, an isolated opportunity by itself. And again, Zach will go into a little bit more detail on that. Zach, you also wanted to look at XLP and XLU, so I'll, I'll let you do that. But I just wanted to point out XLP, usually a late um, rotation sector and an area where people sometimes look towards for defense. Uh, do, the, do think that we have some opportunity here and a potential setup to continue higher based on the pattern that we've seen off of this May low here. But what I wanted to do is basically um, highlight two stocks that I think stand out from that sector. Uh, the two beverage companies, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, really both seem to have set setups for further upside. Um, much stronger setups than a lot of the individual stocks. So if I were to look for individual opportunities within that sector, KO and Pep is where I would look first. 
So uh, with all that, I'm going to pass it over to Zach, or I guess, Tom, you should do that. Absolutely. I'll pass that mic right now. And thank you so much, Garrett, for sharing that with us. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Zach. Uh, I work with Garrett in the stock waves in the mining stock service. Um, as Garrett was, was explaining, um, there, there's some potential for immediate upside. And, you know, one of the questions that we get asked a lot with regard to this larger fourth wave is in stock waves, is there any, are there any stocks or any sectors where I can just push everything and camp out there and be safe for the duration of this possible fourth wave? Um, and, you know, with, with, you know, looking at things that are typically used as defense, starting with the XLP sector, you know, we see that it, it too looks like it is topped in a primary wave three and that it put in that top at the January high and it already has a significant move down and then a corrective retrace. Um, you know, Garrett and I usually have most of our counts within stock waves are pretty similar. Um, Garrett's parentheses B wave is looking up here at this higher um, setup for more of a C wave up first setting up for more of an expanded flat for that primary wave four. But I just wanted to look at this in a little bit a little bit closer that if we have started that larger primary wave four that's going to take um, the market down possibly into um, the late uh, 2020, um, maybe election season, um, it, we have a, a temporary setup for possibly higher um, but it really looks like we need more of this larger fourth wave first in the consumer staples ETF before it's really ready to bottom in its P5, which could certainly come ahead of that unless it's going to get this larger. And let me go ahead and put that on my chart here in line with the red, where it would get a larger, wider um, ABC correction. And so instead of the P4 over here, um, it would have that primary fourth wave maybe somewhere more as a flat um, over into possibly the beginning of 2020 or maybe this stretches out. Um, but a lot of people might be looking to move into some of those defensive names. And as, we sh as Garrett showed, some of those beverages like Coke and Pepsi and there are a couple other names that we'll be following in stock waves look like maybe if the market's going to try for an, an immediate high or even if it's going to go for immediate sell off, maybe some of those names benefit from some of that rotation initially and then the rest of the primary wave four starts to hit everything in the market um, all equities across the board and there really isn't a safe place to hide or possibly that rotation happens first with more of an immediate sell-off but then the the consumer staples bottom in their primary wave four well ahead of the rest of the market and then start whatever move to the upside into that possible market low. Um, so, you know, one of those things that we look for in, in terms of trying to tell a story and look at all of the different points of data um, as, as far as the individual names that make up the sectors and individual sectors that make up the markets um, to find those opportunities for you. Um, moving on, taking a look at XLU, the utility ETF, which is also another one of those places that traditionally people talk about as a defensive safe haven that could be a good spot to store your money when the market gets volatile. We see that it too has this choppy move up that really looks like it could easily have topped, um, whether in, in five waves up here at a larger C wave, or maybe this is just that same primary wave three, and this is an A and a B setting up for a drop in the C wave of this primary wave four, and then maybe heading up higher. Um, but it does not look like this is a, an immediate bullish setup and a good spot to move um, some funds at the moment in terms of a safe haven. Um, it is possible if this move right here pushes up just a little bit higher um, that we have one, two, three, four, and five waves up off the low. Um, and this fourth could maybe even come back down to 51 as a flat and then get the fifth wave. And if we then held a, cons a corrective consolidation again into the 50 region, then there might be a more immediate bullish setup here in, in the utilities to take that higher off of this earlier February low. But from right here, we only see three waves up 
that has a potentially even more bearish setup than some of the other areas of the market. Um, at the very least, counting this as a potential A and a B wave at this 55 resistance level, setting up for a possible C wave down into the mid to low 40s. Um, so, you know, while there might be opportunities that present themselves, some of these traditional places to look for safety may not be the best places to hide your money during this, this next downturn. Um, next, I wanted to take a look at um, the, oh, let's stay on this chart, um, take a look at the bond yields because the interest rates, as Mike um, Golombeski pointed out, was one of the recent things that um, the increasing interest rates is what one of the recent drops was based on. Um, in this yield chart, this is a, a yield of TNX.XO, um, which is a measure of, I think, the 10-year the Treasury yield. And it's expressed in a, as it, the Treasury yield right now is about 33.18% uh, yield. Um, but on this chart, that's expressed as 31.8% or 31.8 as a dollar value. Um, but we had been tracking um, the yields uh, for a larger corrective bounce as a big fourth wave um, since the you know 2012 lows, and then certainly off of even though this dipped a little bit deeper as the B wave, we had a very nice completing ABC correction um, for that B wave into the July 2016 lows, and have been watching this um, five wave move up, complete the C wave for this big flat completing a larger fourth wave. Um, so in, is, if you overlay a, a picture of the general stock market, you can see that during most of this time, while interest rates were rising, the market was also coming up. You know, the low in um, the January or February 2016 low in the market was over here. Um, we had steady movement up. You know, this bigger move down came during some of those corrective moves. But then even though the interest rates rose from 1.4 roughly to 3.2, um, it didn't seem to become an issue until very, very recently with that move over 3%. Um, but it turns out that, that that's very, very close to what we're tracking as a possible top in this primary degree C wave of a larger fourth and setting up for a very significant move down which possibly just the A wave of that move down could coincide with a the larger primary degree fourth wave in those equity markets. Um, and then building on that, looking at um, the TLT, which is the in one of the index ETFs that tracks the intermediate duration bonds um, in terms of going long bond prices, uh, we have a possible five wave move up that completed into the July 2016 high and a corrective retrace that matches what we saw with that five wave move up um, to complete an expanded flat. So it, really you could count this as an expanded flat for the same fourth wave and be looking for a fifth wave up to new highs. Um, but on the TLT, I think that counts a little bit better as an alt. But at the very least, we have a nice corrective consolidation completing, completing five waves down in a C wave from the September 2017 highs, setting up for at least a pretty substantial bounce. Um, and regardless of whether this is a larger degree B wave, targeting up into the 126 to 130 region, or if it is the primary degree A wave of that final fifth, um, we should see a nice corrective move up towards this 133 region, probably in line with um, that same larger degree ABC move down in the broad equity markets. So long duration bonds in US treasuries does seem like a potential spot um, to try and park some longer term capital. They could give you, it, it's not gonna be a nice, slow, steady climb. You can see that this is a, a pretty choppy move and whichever way we're coming up into this region is probably going to have a pretty significant retrace. And as, as Leo mentioned, um, similar to the, the spikes in, in volatility, that some of those bounces in the market could see pretty sharp drops um, on shorter term times, you know, as, as deep retraces 
as it chops its way up into this, this 126, 130 region. Um, so this is one name that we are going to be following in, in pretty close detail as a long candidate in stock waves, both looking at it from, you know, as long as it continues to track in terms of a longer term bounce and when it starts to give us confirmation of signs of a bottom, because right now it can certainly extend a little bit lower towards the 110 region. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that we do in stock waves is we'll show multiple durations of charts. And so that analysis will work for some people that are looking to just make sure that a longer term uh, analysis is, is continuing to stay on track. Um, whereas, and we also provide smaller time frame charts as well that some of our members may be using to initiate shorter term swing positions and even day trades. Uh, next, I wanted to take a look at a couple of ratio charts uh, because we were asked about uh, precious metals and the mining stocks. And as Garrett mentioned with the um, materials and, and the, the global mining sector, the XME, there does seem to be a more substantial opportunity setting up there that could run counter to any larger correction in the market. Um, and I know we shy away from measures of, uh, from actual correlation. And when you put charts side by side, you can see that there are certainly periods of time where things where the general equities market and the metals and miners both rallied together or where they both fell together and sometimes where they moved independent and sometimes where there seemed to be absolutely no correlation at all. Um, but when we look at a ratio chart and, and keep in mind that a lot of these, you know, sometimes some people look at gold and silver as a real store of value, even more so than regular dollars. And so looking at a chart of the broad stock market index priced in terms of gold um, might be a very good way of uh, analyzing and seeing, you know, where we might be in terms of, of a potentially significant top. Um, so as Avi mentioned with Elliott Wave, we look at things in, in five wave moves. And after we see a five wave move completing, we look for a much larger three wave retrace into a general um, normal Fibonacci region. So as we can see off of a 2011 low for this ratio chart at a ratio of about 0.6, we have a very clear five wave movement up in the SPX to gold ratio. Um, with nice subwaves completing five waves up in that possible fifth um, and starting to put in a pretty significant reversal. Um, so even if this was a, a significantly large wave one, the wave two, just getting a corrective retrace, should come back down from a ratio in the, in the low twos all the way down to 1.43, possibly even as deep as 1.02 in terms of a ratio to the value of the SPX to the price per ounce of gold. And similar to the SPX to gold ratio chart, um, I also have built a, an SPX to um, Huey chart. Um, Huey is the gold bugs index, which is a broader index of gold and silver and, and other precious metals, copper included mining stocks. And we see that on this chart, we have a five wave move up off of a 2011 low that completed into the 2015 high, which was where gold and the miners put in a more significant bottom already and have moved up strongly off of that into 2016. Um, but it then had a, a much longer drawn out retrace um, for a, a very deep and long term primary wave two um, that possibly put in a, a bottom there. Um, but very possibly can get one more push up um, or, or drop down in a final fifth wave um, of a, the, that C wave. But this combined with the likelihood that we hit a larger degree top in the SPX um, certainly looks good for the start of a larger C wave down in this ratio, um, taking it from the 17.6 region all the way down towards the mid single digits. Um, and just to see what that Huey chart looks like and, and give you an idea of what we're expecting, even if this is, is more in line with that larger, um, with just that larger C wave that we had looked at, 
um, a measured move would be taking the Huey index up into the, the high threes of the 400 region. And we really think that that can be just the first wave in this larger primary wave three starting um, in an even larger cycle degree wave three that started off of that late 2015 low in the general um, precious metals mining sector. Um, and that is about all that I wanted to cover, Tom, if you want to open it up for questions. Absolutely. So we would love to try to get to some Q&A here. Um, I just want to flip back and make myself a presenter so you can see. Again, um, I shared this link in the chat and just kind of goes over um, each one of the guys that took the time to present tonight. And, of course, our sponsor, Gold Eagle, which we uh, greatly appreciate uh, them being involved with us as well. So uh, just in terms of some, some broader items here from questions that I saw that came through from multiple people, um, if you're one uh, of those logging in that has never tried Elliott Wave Trader before, you have no clue who we are, or maybe know us on the periphery but never tried it, we do offer a 15-day free trial, which you can start right from the homepage, ElliottWaveTrader.net, with just your name and email. There's no credit card required to take the initial trial. And even some of you that maybe tried us a long time ago, I want to check back in. You can log in under your old account and it'll confirm uh, you are likely eligible for another trial. But before you even have to get started, um, it'll confirm if you are or you aren't. Um, we also got some questions about international exchanges. We're just not going to have time to kind of go into those more. But we do have a service uh, and it happens to be ran by Garrett. Uh, that actually covers 10 international markets um, every day. So 10, 10 indices outside of the U.S. So um, if you're interested in things, I think the, the Stocks 50 was one I saw asked in the uh, Hang Seng, Shanghai. Um, you might be interested in that world market service. Uh, similarly, I know some of you asked about foreign currencies um, uh, exchanges. You might be interested to know that Mike... Uh, who did our uh, VIX presentation tonight and also who runs our VIX service is also a lead analyst in a Forex service we have. So if you're really interested in foreign currency pairs um, and how those might trade during this time, um, or if you're just interested in that in general, uh, you might be interested in the Forex service with Mike and uh, he co-hosts that with another analyst of ours, Arkady. So uh, that might be another something that you want to take a look at. So Javi, I know you were watching uh, some of the questions come through. I wanted to see if there's anything that you uh, caught on that you wanted to to cover, because I know we have limited time. Yeah, when I was looking, when I was looking at most of the questions, most of the questions really have been answered by our guys. I mean, <clears throat> people are asking some, some some specific questions, but I mean, I, I don't think we can go through much more in the way of specifics than what we've uh, we've identified here. People are asking about gold and GDX, and you know what? I, I think I think Zach gave everybody a, a nice taste of where we are uh, on the overall uh, structure in, in in the mining index. So I, I think that really is it touched upon it very nicely, especially since this is not. A, uh, a gold uh, focused um, webinar. Overall, I, I think everybody got a pretty good understanding from a lot of what we've been through, especially when the guys went through the individual stocks. Um, you know, overall, the, the general perspective is the market, and this is the first time we've done, you know, I, I know everybody watches CNBC and you get all those markets in turmoil type of, uh, type of shows. You know, this is the first time we've done anything like this in many, many years. So, you know, the fact that we're even doing one now should explain to you that, you know, we're really looking for a, the market um, looking towards a topping. Uh, the question is, as you saw from the various charts, some have topped, some may have topped. And there are a couple that may even look like it may try to push higher, which is why I was discussing that potential expanded B wave um, uh, scenario. So, over the next several months, I think a lot of this is going to shake out, but it does not look like the market is going to be, you know, hitting that 30% sell-off target, you know, next month. It's not, we didn't do this for you guys to just turn around and say, okay, I got to go net short right now. That's not really the case. I, I think the case is suggesting from all the different charts that I, I think it's going to take months until this market seems ready to really set up for that big decline to that 2100, 2200 region. And I really think um, that, is, uh, that is pretty much what you really have to focus on, that we are in a likely topping 
phase. And again, this is the first time we've said this. We've been very, very bullish for many years now. And this is the first time we've come out and said, you know what? It's really time to consider risk. And it's really time to look at this and say, the market is now developing a topping phase. And it's time to start, you know, checking out to some extent. And, you know, where there's some potential, you can still try and ride it. But, you know, where when the market does try to get up higher, uh, you may want to really start considering the amount of risk you want to be carrying as we move into 2019 and 2020. The, uh, the risks are clearly rising that the market's going to enter into a 30% uh, correction. So I, I think that's probably the main thing we want you guys to get out of this, uh, this webinar and understand really where the risks are overall.